folks we are leaving uh, Derby today we spent a couple of nights here yesterday we went out to uh, Tunnel Gorge uh, Tunnel Creek and Winjana Gorge um, Derby I don't know what can I tell you about Derby it's, uh, it's not a very big town there's a few people live here but uh, there's not really much here that they can do for tourism uh, it is the start of the Gibb River Road so that's probably their advantage but uh, there's a couple of things I mean if you wanted to go to the horizontal falls it's a little bit cheaper to fly from here than it is from Broome because it's a little bit closer from here uh, so you can get a bit, a bit cheaper that way Ah, uh, Tunnel Creek with Jana Gorge, of course you can do them. Um, just out of town, there's the prison tree and the um, Australia's longest water trough. That's about it. So not a lot of people come here because when you're heading north or south, you stay on the Great Northern Highway quite a long distance out of uh, Derby, I think it's about 40 something kilometres out of Derby so there's no real reason to come here unless perhaps you were doing the um, Gib River Road or, or wanting to go out to Winjana because what we did is we left our caravan in the caravan park and just went out for a day trip rather than risking taking the van out on the uh, gravel roads um, but if they bitumenise the uh, Gibb River Road I could see things changing for Derby because now people have got to come into town to get to the Gibb River Road well it's a couple of kilometres before town but it's more an incentive to come here they just really need to find something to do for tourism to uh, encourage people to come here uh, back in the old days they uh, used to export cattle out of here that doesn't happen anymore. Um, I'm not really sure what does happen here as far as the jet is concerned. It's a nice little thing to go and have a look at. Uh, it has uh, Australia's biggest uh, tides. It might even be the biggest tides in the world, I'm not sure. But 12 metres is the tide. And, uh, we've just been down to the jetty and had a look and uh, the tide's on the way out at the moment. But um, I have seen boats parked on the jetty sitting on the dirt because the tide's out so far and of course with big tides it makes a problem for getting boats in and out of the harbour as well I'm not sure what the distance is from, from the uh, jetty to the harbour but uh, yeah I can see the bitumenising of the Gibb River Road they have to have some sort of advantage to Derby at least it's a clean, tidy town. Anyway, apart from doing a stop up here at Woolworths, we are, um, oh, coppers are doing RBTs here. Um, apart from doing a Woolworths stop, we're heading uh, south. It is the last day of leg three. And it's supposed to go into Broome, but we're not actually going to go into Broome because um, we did that on the way up and we feel that we've done everything we want to do in Broome, so there's no point in going back in. So we're going to continue south and hopefully do an overnight stop at Stanley Rest Area. 
we're going to be like a lot of the other older people. We're going to show up at about one o'clock and set up for, night, uh, for the camp for the night. Um, because our next stop is, is Port Hedland. And if we stop at Stanley, then uh, it's a comfortable distance into Port Hedland for the next day. It's not a rush day or anything like that. So uh, once again, we're just basically backtracking. You know, thinking about comments I was making about uh, Derby being a quiet place. I mean, you look at the caravan park. The caravan park was pretty full. So obviously people are coming in for something. I mean, I'm guessing a lot of them are either just finished the Gibb River Road or about to start one. Uh, a bloke behind me I was talking to this morning, they're going to be doing the Gibb River Road. Um, but it's not like nobody's in town people are obviously coming into town um, but uh, when that road opens up as a bitumen road the Gibber River Road I think it's going to be quite a busy little place so I'll chuck that in there Well if you're into fishing, I'm told there's a pretty good catch to be had from the jetty. And if you don't get anything, there's always a cafe come restaurant at the end of the jetty for a good feed. Frosty Pool Built in 1944 as a bathing area for the troops stationed here during the Second World War. Frosty's Pool was named after a platoon member, Charles Frost. Just down the road from the pool is Australia's longest water trough. The original well was dug in the early 1890s. The trough was built in 1910. At the time it could water 500 bullocks. The windmills added some time after 1919. The water from the bore has a rich mineral content and was reputed to have therapeutic properties. And next to that is the Boab prison tree. This huge tree is believed to be around 1500 years old and has a girth of 14.7 metres. It was used as a staging point for prisoners being walked into Derby in the early days. You can get a plane from Derby that takes you out to the Horizontal Falls. It's slightly cheaper from here because it's a little bit closer. After leaving Derby, we're heading south. We'll stop and fill up our fuel tank at the garage at Roebuck Bay before bypassing Broome on our way to what we hope will be our overnight camp spot at Stanley. So this leg is Broome to Perth, but we're not actually in Broome, we're um, about 176 kilometres south of Broome uh, in a place called uh, Stanley, it's an overnight rest stop. We did Broome on the way up and figured it was nothing we needed to do there anymore so we uh, would uh, continue on. Um, but uh, we're going to be stopping in Port Hedland tonight and then uh, we'll be taking the Great Northern Highway for this part home and stopping into places like Karajini National Park. Nah, don't panic, we didn't camp next to the Dunnies. These are the old ones that nobody uses anymore. They've got new eco-friendly toilets on the other side that everybody uses. While a few people have already left this morning, it wasn't very busy, and it was a pretty quiet camp here last night. 
You're in from the road, so you don't hear much of anything running up and down the road at night. As we leave, it's the usual rubbish stop before we hit the road. Tonight we're staying in the same Port Hedland caravan park that we were in on the way up north. If you want to have a look at that part, then check out my video of Leg 1 Part 4 of the Darwin Road Trip series. So it's a bit of deja vu. We were here about four weeks ago. Except, yeah, except uh, we were heading north. Where unfortunately we're heading south and probably only about four days away from home, which is a bummer. You know, I came out here to dump the toilet, and as I was walking along, the bloke came out to me and he says, Are you going to go and dump that? <laughs> I thought to myself, No, nah, mate. I just always take my dunny for a flame and walk around the park before I leave. Uh, here's your sign. It's a sign moment. <coughs> and he's parked right next to the dunny. Now, where do you do that? It's just around the corner here. He's on one side of the shed and the dunny dumps on the other. It might have been his first time away because he looked a little overdressed to be a camper. <laughs> that one there, that white one. Concept. Oh, it was worth the laugh. Well, today we're not travelling far. We're only doing about three and a half hours down the road. We're going to go to Karajini and stop in Karajini, but. Uh, bit hit and miss and whether you can get a spot in there so um, rather than trying to get in the Karajini not getting there then having the backtrack decided we're going to just stop at the I think it's Erski or something uh, roadhouse they have a caravan park there and uh, we're going to stop into that and then um, maybe this afternoon we will um, Go and do a couple of bits of the national park, or a couple of things we're going to look at, and uh, then um, uh, do the rest of it tomorrow. So it's only going to take us probably three and a half, four hours. I'm not going to rush. There's no point in rushing. We've got all day, so uh, just going to plod along. Going to go through a. Uh, Nice little mountain pass. I've only been through it once when I was up here with me work. We couldn't go the road we had to get, were supposed to go because it had been raining and it had turned the mud and the uh, Rio Tinto, it's a Rio Tinto access road. They closed it because it was uh, too dangerous. And um, so we had to come up through the Great Northern Highway and backtrack to Caratha, which I'd never been up that way before, so I was quite excited. It was some, some amazing drive through the pass so we'll be doing that this morning on the way out and um, yeah so we I think there's a, a pull-in bay we might stop and have a look there on the way through so not a lot of plans today tomorrow's our big day around Karajini like I said we'll see what happens for the day when we get to the park anyway that's it So this is where our backtracking finally comes to an end. When we came up from Perth, we came up this road that we've seen straight in front of us. That's the uh, the road back to Caratha. 
uh, Exmouth, Carnarvon, Monkey Mire, all that stuff was all covered in the first couple of uh, of legs of or couple of shows of this uh, road trip. So you can have a look back at that if you want to see that. We're now continuing around and we're staying on the Great Northern Highway and we're going to go down through the guts of the of, of the Pilbara. The Pilbara is the um, the money pit for Australia, effectively. Um, most of our mining is all done in this region and um, it's, it's mostly iron ore out through here. A lot of the mi mining companies out here, uh, some of them have uh, railway lines which run into Port Helen um, to uh, get rid of their iron ore. But some of the smaller ones can't afford to have train ra railway lines so they use trucks what we call here in Australia, road trains. And uh, we've already seen, just driving out of Port Eden, I think we've probably passed maybe a dozen uh, mining trucks going into uh, Port Hedlin now. Uh, but they're going in and we're coming out. So uh, I'm pretty sure we will eventually have some coming past us and we're on the line. I'll be amazed if we don't. I, I mean, I'm amazed we've travelled this far and haven't had any trucks pass us. So. Uh, so we'll be going through the, the Pilbara for the next couple of days. Let's talk about the mining up here. say uh, Lang Hancock discovered the iron ore out here. Well he didn't really discover it. People knew about the iron ore long before he came along. Um, and they were mining iron ore out here but before the Second World War there was an uh, embargo on exporting iron ore uh, by the Australian government. They thought that there probably isn't a lot around so they wanted to hang on to what iron ore they could find uh, because back then it was before Second World War and they could sort of see I guess in the future the possibility of uh, a war so they wanted to keep what they could get themselves. After the Second World War, uh, long after, um, Lang Hancock, he's got a fa fa family farm out here, or family station out here, um, somewhere. Well, actually, I think it's still in front of us somewhere. Um, and he used to fly a plane to Perth and backwards and forwards sort of thing. And as the story goes, one day he was flying back up to his farm and there was some thunderstorms around, so he was ducking and weaving and going down a bit lower and that sort of thing to get around the thunderstorms. And he happened to fly over an area that he's never really flown, flown over before. And he happened to look out the window and thought, gee, that looks a little bit redder than the rest of the place. So he made a note of the position and when he landed, he uh, a couple of days later, he went out with his four-wheel drive and had a bit of a look around, trying to get back into that area that he flew over. And he discovered that it was a lot of, it was a high concentration of iron ore in that area. So uh, he started buying up stations. Now, up until recently, the Hancocks never owned an iron ore mine. They bought up all the land around the place and all the iron ore companies came in and they're leasing off of him and that's how he made big dollars out of that. But it was always his plan to uh, have his own iron ore mine one day. Well, in his lifetime it never happened, uh, but uh, his daughter Gina Reinhardt, which I'm sure you've all heard of it, she um, kept that dream going and about, oh, I guess maybe three years ago, they finally um, started producing iron ore in her mine um, and uh, they export that through Port Hedland. So um, she sort of brought his dream alive the fact that they now actually have their own iron ore mine. 
But up until then, basically, they leased the land and, and um, made their money that way. But, uh, it's certainly an amazing land to be driving through. So that's more or less the brief story of, of the current iron ore explosion here. Uh, he kicked it all off. The Pilbara region covers just over 507,000 square kilometres. That's about twice the size of the UK and is where most of Australia's wealth comes from. They mine gold, copper, zinc, huge gas fields off the coast, but mostly iron ore. There are even plans to build a lithium mine out here. We're stopping at the Oski Roadhouse for a couple of nights. Out here, most roadhouses will have a caravan park out the back. We'll take a look at the park tomorrow, but at the moment, we're just going to set the van up, and then we're going to head to the northern part of the Karajini National Park, where we'll have a look at an old mining ghost town, before we get into the Hammersley Gorge. We've just stopped here along the road here. Um, just noticing these things here for the last uh, probably 100 or so kilometres notice the uh, wildflowers starting to come out we're starting to get into the top end of the wildflower area uh, West Australia is well known around the world for its wildflowers and at this time of the year there are thousands and thousands of tourists coming here to uh, come and check them all out um, Throughout West Australia there's 12,500 different species of, of wildflowers and somewhere in the state at any time of the year there is always something that's flowering but this time period now is sort of like uh, end of August to the end of uh, October kind of period is uh, usually pretty busy with wildflowers and, and uh, I heard they reckon this is going to be the best year in 10 years but I think they've been saying that for the last few years anyway. But I just pulled over the side of the road here, this stuff's called Mulla Mulla. Um, I think that's an Aboriginal word, but don't think that I know anything about plants and flowers and stuff like that. Um, to me, basically, there are three kinds of plants. There are green ones, brown ones, and black ones. They're either alive, dead, or burnt. They fit in there somewhere. Um, so I don't know much about plants, but there's a couple of plants I do know a little bit about, but basically I don't know anything. But anyway, if you're into wildflowers, that's another excuse to come to Western Australia to come and have a look around. But this stuff here, this is, as I said, I think it's called Mulla Mulla. I'm pretty sure it's Mulla Mulla. heaps of this stuff all around here right through big clumps of it so uh, if I see anything else further as we head towards Perth that uh, looks outstanding I might stop and have a look at that as well but this is not a wildflower show anyway let's continue on Whitnoon was a thriving town from around 1947 to the mid-1960s. The reason it was here had to do with some blue stuff they found in the ground, which they mined. That stuff was called asbestos. It was used to make fencing, roofing, walls, house insulation. Asbestos was used in anything to protect people from anything hot or cold. It was a great insulator. Although the government knew that asbestos was deadly, they mined it out here for almost 30 years before they closed it down. After the mine closed in 1966, most people didn't want to leave the town. In fact, there were about 40,000 tourists coming here every year. Around the 1980s, the government cut all services and references to the town in an effort to get the residents to move out and wipe it completely off the map. Today there are only a few people who still live here. Most of the buildings have all been removed because they were built from asbestos. Driving around the streets, 
and the fact that there are so many streets gives you a real sense of how big the town was in its heyday. But it's from the air that you really see how spread out it was. People are not encouraged to come here because of the asbestos risk. And the old mine site is completely off limits because of the fibres still blowing around. Unfortunately, this includes the spectacular Whitnoon Gorge, although it is still used by locals and tourists for camping and swimming. I think Telstra left something behind. But it can't have been too bad, too old, because from the box here you can still do SMSs. So I, mean, I don't know how long SMS has been around, but uh, clearly by the time they took the service out, SMS was available. In its time there were about, or oh, several thousands at least, people living here in this town. There's heaps of streets and, and you can see where houses used to be, so it was a pretty big place. Now the mine site itself, I think, was up that direction. And over here to the left, if I continue down that road down there, that'll go down to the gorge. Um, but I'm not going to go that way, which is a bit of a shame because, as I said, it's pretty spectacular. But I'm going to continue out that way because I'm going to go to Hammersley Gorge, which I'm pretty sure, and I know for a fact, is pretty spectacular in itself. Just dozed over here in the grass, a bit of a... Uh, Stuart Desert Pea down here as well. road to get around it but there's a gravel road that basically goes all around you can do a big circle sort of thing um, now my plan was to stay in Karajini and then go around for the day but uh, Karajini the national park there you can stay in the park but it's the first in best rest and uh, the chances of us getting in and getting a spot could be slim and I didn't want to backtrack the other options is you go to uh, Tom Price stay at the caravan park at Tom Price, it's only an hour and a half into Karajini uh, or as we've done at that Ursky, I think it's called, um, roadhouse, they've got a caravan park there, we've stopped there uh, and what I've done is uh, this afternoon I've come out, we're gonna, we've looked at um, uh, Whitnoon and we're going out to Hammersley Gorge uh, for today. Tomorrow, that gives us the whole day to look at Karajini. We don't have to rush, we don't have to leave early, we won't be back late. So it uh, plans out quite well that way. Um, for coming down from the north, it's to go to Tom Price, it's a bit... You'd either have to go down the coastline and then come across to Tom Price, or go down Great Northern Highway, go past Karajini to go to Tom Price, and then backtrack the next day for an hour and a half to look at Karajini, then go back to the caravan at Tom Price and then come back across here to Great Northern Highway and it's too much backwards and forwarding so the Oski uh, is um, was the best option for us. Now these gravel roads, there's heaps of them through this area and there are heaps of mine sites through this area. Um, so pretty much don't go off the main gravel road because you could end up in, in uh, mining property and they won't be very happy. But the roads themselves are generally in a fairly good condition uh, because they're maintained by the mines because the mines have big heavy trucks going along them all the time so they generally have graders and things constantly maintaining the roads. There is a road that goes from where Hammersley Gorge is to um, uh, Karapa following the train line. You can do that but the road belongs to Rio Tinto. 
to be allowed to use that, the driver has to set a small test. You can do it online. If you have a look uh, on Google search for Rio Tinto Access Road, uh, that'll get you to where you need to go to. And then you do the little uh, test, it takes about 30 minutes. And uh, if you get it wrong, it just sends you back to the beginning and you go, you just don't have to do the whole test again, you just do from where you got, got it wrong sort of thing. Um, or you can go into the um, Tom Price Visitor Centre or the Carafa Visitor Centre. And you do the test in there, you watch a bit of a video, answer the same questions. And it's all basically about road, uh, road uh, sense. Like on the on their road, you can't do more than 80 kilometres an hour. Um, don't stop at the trains. You're not allowed to be more than uh, less than 20 metres away from a train uh, or the train line. Um, about railway crossings, work crews, and all that sort of stuff. And they do have um, their version of a police that go up and down the gravel roads, checking to make sure that you have a permit. Now, if you do the test and you get the permit, you must be the one driving. You can't have somebody else driving and you're sitting in the passenger seat because you've got the permit, it doesn't work that way. If you get caught, then you will be turned around and sent back the way you've come. Um, and I'm not sure if there's any kind of fine or anything like that involved, but uh, you certainly will be kicked off pretty smartly. Um, but other than that, it's, it's a, not a bad road to drive. Um, again, it's maintained well, and uh, you get to see lots and lots of trains as you're travelling along, along the road there. So uh, these tracks are real worthwhile doing. through there. Um, it's like a, um, a miniature tornado sort of thing but there's no sort of damage or anything generally done with them. Uh, Cockeye Bobs is another name for them. Um, I think there's another one as well but generally over here in WA we call them Willy Willies. I think the East Coast mostly call them Cockeye Bobs. As we head to the Hammersley Gorge, we have to pass through the cut into the Hammersley Ranges. This is where you really need to have a CB radio. Mining trucks pass through here all the time, and you don't want to meet one of them in the cut. There are places where two vehicles can't pass each other. That's why the truckies announce themselves entering and leaving the cut so others can wait for them. If you meet one in here, then it will be you that has to reverse back to find a pullover area to let the truck through. Just on the other side of the cut is the turn off to Hammersley Gorge. If you look up Hammersley Gorge in Google, it'll tell you it's set in the Hammersley Ranges in the heart of the Pilbara. Swirls of rocks sweeping down through the gorge and waterfalls rush into tranquil pools. All that means, it's bloody amazing.
this is a great spot to be able to uh, see how the land was formed. You can see all the different layers in there. They were laid flat, but it was all underwater. And, uh, and I'm not a ge geologist either, so, uh, but um, it was all laid flat. And then after millions of years, there was earthquakes and things. And it shifted some sections up, some sections went down, and that's why we've now got all this waves in the rock. There's just, over millions of years, different earthquakes have been pushing the land in different ways. And we've just been seeing that all the way along the whole top end of, of, of West Australia and into Northern Territory. We see those ridges and how they're, they're, they're sort of sloping down at an angle um, because at some point it's been pushed up through an earthquake or something. <sighs> Bloody amazing. Anyway, that's it. We're going to head back to the caravan for the night and then do the other part of Carrow Journey tomorrow. So as we start our drive back to the Oski Roadhouse, that brings an end to this episode. If you liked what you saw, then hit the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out when I release the next video. Join us next week for our last episode in this series when we go to the Karajini National Park. But till next time, happy travels.